Yo, what is up guys? Welcome to the video. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about today. Yesterday, the Boston Uprising were upset by the Dallas Fuel. Honestly, I can't say I saw this one coming. There definitely always was the possibility that Dallas Fuel could pick this set up, but it did seem highly unlikely. We got a lot to cover for this set. We'll talk about everything from the Boston Uprising's perspective. Are they sandbagging? It's a possibility, you never know. As for the Dallas Fuel, is the franchise saved? Is Arrow pulling off a miracle and saving the roster? We'll talk about it. Then after that, it was the Florida Mayhem taking on the Los Angeles Valiant. This was a pretty decent set. The maps overall were sort of close. Sia player, as usual, popping off on that Widowmaker. We're going to cover this set, and then moving on to the last one, the Los Angeles Gladiators, the Houston Outlaws. I know a lot of you guys want me to talk about this one. I mean, I have been basically saying for the past month or so, this is the match to keep your eye on because it pretty much just means everything. The winner of this now has the best shot at making the playoffs and the loser is going to be in a struggling position. So if you guys are new here, please do consider subscribing to my channel. I upload content like this every single day. If you want to stay updated with the Overwatch League outside of Twitch, this is your channel. So drop a sub, drop a like, and let's go ahead and hop into it. All right, so starting off with this Dallas Fuel Boston Uprising match. Now, if you would tell me a month ago and say that the Dallas Fuel were going to beat the Boston Uprising in stage four after Boston goes 10 and zero, I would have called you delusional. But honestly, if you look at it right now from an unbiased perspective, it makes sense that Dallas Fuel won. And yeah, I did underestimate them in my power rankings leading up to this stage. I think definitely you have to give a lot of credit to Aero. He is really whipping this team into shape, and you also have to give credit to the meta, because if we were still in stage 3 meta, I think the Dallas Fuel would be struggling very hard. I wouldn't say they got lucky with the meta, but they are definitely in a situation where a lot of the things fell into place for them. It seems like they are running one of the most optimal comps, where they're running that triple tank and Siegel is on the D.Va, Mickey is on the Bridget, and then they have OGE on the main tank. The reason why this kind of fell in place for them is because Siegel, out of nowhere, who knows why, Kai Kai or somebody within the Dallas Fuel organization, decided to have him grind D.Va in the middle of stage two. And because of that, now he's an amazing D.Va. And in my opinion, he was a better D.Va than Mickey was. And now talking about Mickey, he was very inefficient on that D.Va. It seemed like he was mechanically falling behind a lot of the other D.Vas in the game. That and it also seemed like just his coordination overall. He was always on his own getting caught out. Now on the Bridget, he is coming up with unique plays, always putting himself in a really smart position. And the other team is very unexpected of it. It's just overall a hero that isn't as mechanically demanding as others. I'm not saying mechanically he's a bad player, just overall that was one of his issues on D.Va. And now that he's been swapped over to a hero that isn't as mechanically demanding, he's performing great. He's honestly just playing with his brain and strategically with his team. He puts himself in really good spots, catches the other team off guard. He's creating a ton of space. I mean, definitely one of the best Bridgets in the league right now. I haven't really seen any other situations where teams are just getting destroyed by a Bridget other than Muma when he went up against the London Spitfire. And speaking of the Houston Outlaws, this win over the Boston uprising for the Dallas Fuel kind of shows that, uh, you know, I kind of was right with the Houston Outlaws because in the first week they really weren't tested. They went up against a very weak London Spitfire and a very weak Boston uprising. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we cover that set. Anyways, let's get back to the meta and talking about how it fits with the Dallas Fuel. We then move off to the tanks and let's talk about that DPS slot. It's literally perfect for AKM and Taimu. Like, the heroes that they play are basically the only ones in the meta. For AKM, it's Widowmaker it's McCree. Those are the two heroes he plays. They're in the meta. For Taimu, it's Widowmaker, it's McCree, Reaper, Junkrat, all those heroes that were kind of like considered off meta DPS heroes back in like stage two, stage one, stage three. They're pretty much meta now. And we're really seeing Taimu come into his own. Something else to point out that's big for the Dallas Fuel that really isn't meta is that they don't really have any pressure on them anymore. I mean, I know they need to perform for their coach and so that they don't look bad in stage four. But, like, if you look at the pressure they had during stage 1, 2, and 3, where they were pretty much expected to be really good and everybody wanted them to be good, and just so much criticism and hate was coming toward them, now I think everybody's really gotten past that. Effect's no longer there. He's not bringing the team down with depression. 
no offense to him, but I think he was probably bringing the team atmosphere down. I'd say they're probably in a happy phase where they're just playing the game, trying to have a good time, practicing, and they're doing good. I mean, I'm happy for them. Now let's talk a little bit about the maps. Moving on to Blizzard World, the very first one. We saw that team comp come from the Dallas field with the triple tank, one DPS strategy, and it worked very well for them. They had an amazing defense on that second point. The Boston Uprising really couldn't get through that arch. And I should probably talk a little bit more about the Boston Uprising here. They're pretty much in a situation where they're screwed right now. If the meta stays similar to how it is now going into the playoffs, these guys are going to get rolled. Sure, there's some time to adapt and they might be able to do it, but they kind of just don't have the pieces right now. I really think something they should do is possibly adopt the strategy that the Dallas Fuel is running, put Kalios and Note in there, run a triple tank comp where Striker's your solo DPS player, and you can put him on Junkrat, you can put him on McCree, you can put him on Widowmaker because he can play those heroes. The problem is they're forcing mistakes in there on Hanzo and McCree, Junkrat, random stuff. He's just not good. No offense to mistakes, like he's a decent player, but he's not all around that flex god you need on your team right now. He's just not. So the Boston Uprising have found themselves a little bit behind right now, and they really need to start playing catch up. And let's just go ahead and get back into the maps. So Blizzard World, as I said, the Dallas Field, they had a really good hold on second point. They kind of choked out the Boston Uprising. Time they kept making these big plays on Reaper, nice flanks, which by the way, the Boston Uprising probably should have seen coming because he did it multiple times. And yeah, Dallas Field, they had a good defense. Moving on to attack, the Dallas Field definitely did struggle. The Boston Uprising put on a good fight in this map. They took it all the way down to the very last second, but the Dallas Field were able to win that fight going up 1-0 in this set we then moved on to horizon lunar colony and this map was extremely close definitely went back and forth we saw the dallas field swap up their comps they weren't on that triple tank solo dps comp the entire time they ran some sombra for taimu that was interesting to see the good old seagull genji came out that was really fun to watch and the dallas field they had some decent attacks they capped the point with two minutes left then the boston uprising on their attack they really struggled but at the end of the day on the very last team fight they were able to cap and then we saw an overtime round where the Dallas Fuel only had to get a tick in two minutes to take this map. Unfortunately for them, the Boston Uprising, they showed up on this defense. Gamsu played that Arisa. He had a couple plays there to secure the win, or the draw, I should say. And then we moved on to Oasis, where the Dallas Fuel were up 1-0. And at this point, I really thought the Dallas Fuel had it in the bag. After that draw, all they would have to do is either win Oasis or watch Point Gibraltar, and they win the set 2-1, 2-0, whatever it's going to be. And knowing Oasis is basically the Dallas Fuel's map in this meta, you can run that triple tank solo dps comp and they did just that and we also saw akm in here oh and something to point out i forgot to mention unco was in there on uh the flex support instead of chips and he was playing really well so it looks like aero starting to throw some flexibility into the roster really nice to see and they performed it's amazing arrow is really doing a great job this guy deserves a round of applause he's saving the dallas fuel roster right now if it wasn't for this guy i think everything for next season would probably be revamped half the roster more than half the roster would have been gone but i don't know anymore he's saving the franchise Anyways, moving on to Oasis, like I said, this is Dell's Fields map, this is their comp, they've been running it on this map throughout the entire season, pretty much their best map overall, they beat New York Excelsior on it, they took it fairly easy, the first round was close, it was 199, Boston Uprising somewhat looked like they had a chance, but then on that second round, Dell's Fields weren't playing around, and this is honestly their best round on this map, the Dell's Fields, Mickey, he always gets in a corner, he finds a way to get into the back line of the enemy team, just causes absolute chaos, he doesn't die, He's really good on Bridget, guys. I really think he is one of the best in the league right now. I mean, he is one of the only players kind of running it that much, but I guess it's for a reason. He's popping off. So Oasis went in the favor of Dallas Fuel, and they took this set 2-0. And now we're in a situation where the Dallas Fuel have an opportunity to sweep the Boston Uprising 3-0 this stage, being the first team to do it. And on Watchpoint Gibraltar, they did it. We saw AKM again in there on the Widowmaker. And once again, Boston Uprising struggling. They're now running the mistakes on Hanzo. They have Striker on the Widowmaker. They're just trying to find a situation situation where mistakes doesn't struggle and it seems like he's just continuing to struggle he's definitely the biggest issue for them right now they're also running aim god that's something i failed to mention throughout this i don't know how nako was amazing for them throughout stages one through three they really could be sandbagging it's a possibility i'm not saying they let the dallas field just completely beat them but I think the Boston Uprising might be focusing on other things right now rather than winning. Since they are secured in the playoffs, maybe they're just working on developing team synergy and strategy with mistakes and aim god, and they're not too worried about winning. That could be a possibility. I, I'm not saying they are sandbagging 100%. Dallas Field still looked really good, but there are some very questionable decisions coming out of the Boston Uprising that would make me think they are possibly sandbagging. Because again, it doesn't make sense. I think they would really shine if they were running a similar comp as the Dallas Field, 
with Note and Kalios in there. I mean, think about it. I think Kalios could probably be a pretty good Bridget, a good Zarya, and then you could run Note on the Diva 24-7. I mean, Note showed he was one of the best Divas in the league. Kalios is also a good Zarya, and I'm sure he could pick the Bridget up. And then we talk about that solo DPS. Striker can cover all of those heroes. We'll see. It was an interesting set. The Dallas Fuel took a 3-0. I think we've talked about it enough. Round of applause for the Dallas Fuel and Aero. He's saving their organization. Boston Uprising, possibly sandbagging. We'll just have to see how the rest of the stage plays out. Then moving on to that second matchup, we won't talk about this one too much. It was the Florida Mayhem and the Los Angeles Valiant. Now that very first map, Kings Row, what a map. That was super fun to watch. The Florida Mayhem, they pulled off an incredible overtime attack. One of the most epic team fights I have seen in the Overwatch League. I don't know how long this fight went on for. I should count, but I'm definitely going to play it in the background right now. Just back and forth. Say a player kept getting picks. Tanks kept just getting low, but then they'd magically stay alive and get healed. One would go down and then they would come back and it was just an epic team fight. It seemed like nobody was going to win it. Slowly, the Florida Mayhem kept making progress. But yeah, things to point out for this set. Sai player, he looked great as usual. This, this guy's really one of the best Widowmakers in the league right now. Unstoppable. And because of this crazy overtime push, the Florida Mayhem, they were able to go up on King's Row 1-0 in this set. We then moved on to Hanamura, which wasn't that close. It was a little bit. We did see Florida Mayhem able to cap both of the points, but they didn't have any time left. And the Los Angeles Valiant, they flew through their attack capping both points with over five minutes left so it was a fairly easy map for the la valiant tying the series up one to one we then moved over to Li Zhang tower and this map was a bit closer than hanamura was we saw both of the rounds go basically 99 99 back and forth the entire time but los angeles valiant they came up clutch in that last fight every single time winning Li Zhang tower going up in the series two to one then moved on to watch point gibraltar where florida mayhem to be honest had a really good chance to take this and force a game five but unfortunately, they weren't able to do it. They started off on attack, and I'd say they had a decent attack. Basically, how Gibraltar works, you cap first, and then on second point, usually you snowball it. But if you can't snowball it, you're gonna get held. Once you lose control of that second phase on Gibraltar as the attacking team, the defense, they're gonna set up, and it's nearly impossible to get through, especially in this meta. So we saw Florida Mayhem really struggle here, and the Valiant, they got the hold off. But where Florida Mayhem really could have won this was on their defense. First point, they held the Valiant all the way down to the very last team fight. It was overtime, and they were literally inches away from closing this out, but unfortunately, they just weren't able to do it. The Valiant, they came up clutch again, just as they've done multiple times in this series. And after they won that overtime fight, they snowballed second, and it was an easy win for them, taking the series 3-1. to one. So that was pretty much it for this set. Pretty interesting one. Valiant, they go up 3-0 so far in the stage. And now let's move on to that last set of the day, which I know you guys want to hear about. The Houston Outlaws taking on the Los Angeles Gladiators. And this series was insane. I think mainly because of Dorado. Some of the maps weren't the closest, but that very last one was insane. So let's just go ahead and start off and let's talk about the very first map. It was King's Row, and we actually saw Void debut finally in the Overwatch League. And something I didn't know, he wasn't in Korea. I guess he didn't have a visa this whole entire time. I thought he was there in the United States practicing and everything with them, but I guess not. He arrived like three days ago, and this was the first time he was available to play. So they put him in for King's Row, they let him play the Zarya, he was on some D.Va, and honestly he struggled. He didn't look that great, definitely could see some rust in his play, probably not used to the environment, just getting here. There's a bunch of excuses you can make for him. He didn't look the best. And on King's Row, I mean, I expected the Houston Outlaws to win this map. If there was a map for them to win in this poll, it was definitely King's Row, especially running Spree and Jake in there with that huge combo they always get. But it was still extremely close. It was back and forth the entire time. And surprisingly, usually on King's Row, it's like, who can attack faster? We're going to have like three minutes left in the time bank after capping all three points. But there was a struggle to push for both teams. They got held on second, barely got to the third point. And it looked like the Gladiators on their defense, they had a good chance at winning this map but then they swapped over to attack and Houston Outlaws they had a great defense too although Gladiators they did run a nice comp on first it was a dive comp with hydration on projectile he was running the Farah, and they were able to cap it pretty quickly they tried to snowball with that dive on second but after it didn't work out they did swap immediately over to tanks and unfortunately for them, they were going up against Spree. And Spree and Jake combo, like I said earlier, I think Houston Outlaws are one of the most unstoppable teams on this map. And they got the hold off. LA Gladiators, they weren't able to do much there on second point. And Houston Outlaws, they went up in the set 1-0. Now at this point, I wouldn't say I was really worried. I knew that the Outlaws had a good chance at winning this map. And if they did, of course, Gladiators were going to bounce back somewhere else in the set. We moved on to Hanamura, and that was the exact case. 
And for some reason, we saw the Outlaws try to dive on first point. They were running Jake on Tracer, and yeah, I don't really know why. When you could run a tank Hanzo comp and try to work picks, even double sniper, which definitely would have worked out way more than running this dive would have for the Houston Outlaws. So a questionable decision coming out from the coaching staff or whoever made that call. The Outlaws, they really struggled to get anything going, and they got first held. Gladiators, all they had to do was cap first, get a tick and a half in, and they did exactly that, winning Hanamura, tying up the series one-to-one. And now this is where it got interesting, because we're moving on to Oasis, another map that can be considered heavy dive, unless you're the Dallas Fuel. And we saw Jake in there on the Pharah, and Hydration in there. And by the way, Hydration, he played all of this set, ran Projectile the entire time. We saw Genji, we saw Pharah, we saw Junkrat, and he played great. Shout out to Hydration, a really big match for him. He popped off, he definitely got the better of Jake here on the Pharahs, and that was a huge reason why they were able to pick this up. The first round wasn't really that close. Houston Outlaws, they won like one team fight, and then they didn't hold the point down for long at all. Gladiators came back and they won this like 100 to 12 percent. The second round though was much closer and it was back and forth. The Outlaws, they were able to pick up a couple fights. Lynxer, he popped off on the McCree a few times, but Surefour's Widowmaker was too much. He got a few picks in that last team fight and gave the win over to the Gladiators, going up in the series two to one. And at this point, I was feeling pretty good about the Gladiators' odds. All they'd have to do is pick up one of the next two maps. Moving on to Dorado, this is a fairly good map for both teams. They've been successful on it each. And we start off with the Houston Outlaws on attack, and they ran this interesting comp. It was a comp that you would kind of see on maybe Junkertown. We had Rockus on the Roadhog. Linkser was on that Widowmaker. And we had a pretty good duel between Surefour and Linkser in this matchup. I would say, though, I think Surefour did get the best of Linkser, especially on Dorado. He, he picked off Linkser in a lot of crucial team fights, especially that very last one, which we'll get to. The Outlaws, they capped the first point with a decent amount of time. It seemed like their Junkertown comp was working, but on that second stage, they ended up getting held for quite some time. Rockus he finally switched over back to support. But as I said, sure for he was getting the best of Linkser here. And the Gladiators, they were able to pick up the hold. Then they swapped sides. And as I said, this map was epic, super close. The Gladiators, they kind of struggled to pick up that first. The Gladiators, they struggled to pick up that first point. The only reason they capped it was because of this epic pulse bomb by sure for He picked up both the supports. And yeah, I keep mentioning sure for He popped off on this map. He was seriously individually a big reason why they won it. Because we moved over to that second point, and again, Surefour, he kept picking Linkser off, and in that very last team fight, he got a huge kill onto him, and it opened up the window for the Gladiators, and they were able to pick it up, taking the series 3-1. to one. Now, overall, if you look at this set, it was close, but it wasn't that close. The Gladiators, they were clearly the better team. They were making the better decisions. They were more versatile in this meta. They were able to run dive. They were able to run those tanks. The only time they mainly struggled was on King's Row. Other than that, they looked like the better team throughout, as I said. And this was big for me. I've been saying it for the past few weeks that the Houston Outlaws, yes, it is a decent meta for them, but they aren't as versatile as you guys think. There are points where they're going to struggle. And the first week we really saw Jake play like better than he ever has in the entire league. He was popping off on Ferry, he was popping off on Tracer, Hanzo, Bridget, whatever it was. He played like six, seven heroes, Genji, throughout both of the matches in the first week, and he looked great on all of them. But this was because he was going up against weak teams. The London Spitfire, the Boston Uprising, these guys were just horrible. They had no teamwork. Didn't know what they were doing when it came to comps in the meta game. It was just free stomps for the Houston Outlaws. And I tried to tell you guys this, and all they would do was read comments. Oh, Michael, you're so dumb. The Houston Outlaws, they're here to stay. They're going to go undefeated. Are you undefeated? I'm not trying to rub it in and, and brag, but it was obvious that the Houston Outlaws, they had a very easy week, and they were going to run into some strong teams. One being the LA Gladiators, who I have been hyping up, saying they... They are the ones who are going to have a good run here in Stage 4. They really are the versatile team that fits this meta perfectly. They can run the dive. They can run the tanks. Sure for, he's really becoming one of the best players in the league. Hydration on the projectile. Then you have Asher in the back. Void coming in. Bishu, he's a god. Fisher's a god. They have the pieces. They really do. And as I mentioned, Jake played amazing in the first week. He's not going to be able to play like that every single week, guys. We've seen Jake. He struggles a lot, especially when it comes to him playing a lot of different heroes. Sure, he can play play those heroes at a decent level, but he can't match up to the best in the world on those heroes. When he goes up against a guy who's better at Tracer than him, he's going to get dominated. When he goes up against a guy who's better at Genji than him, he's going to get dominated. And there's a lot of Tracers and Genjis in the league who are better than him. Even same with the Pharah, which is probably one of his better heroes, but when he goes up against like a Fleta, a Libero, it's not going to be easy for him. I mean, we also saw it against Hydration in this set, so yeah. So all around, there's just a lot of reasons why the Outlaws aren't going to be one of the best teams in this stage, and I'm definitely predicting that they're going to struggle against teams like Shock, 
Dynasty, Valiant. So yeah, that was pretty much it for the set. Ellie Gladiators going up 3-0 on the stage, knocking the Houston Outlaws down 2-1. And now I'm really interested in seeing how the Houston Outlaws are going to do against teams like San Francisco Shock, Seoul Dynasty, LA Valiant, because these are going to be close matches and they're going to determine whether the Houston Outlaws make it or not, or whether Seoul Dynasty makes it or not, or whether the Valiant makes it or not. So we have some really good matches coming up. I'm super excited. The league, it's been amazing so far this stage. And that's going to be it for this video, guys. If you did enjoy it, be sure to drop a like. Also, subscribe to my channel if you enjoy daily Overwatch League content, because that's what I do here. And also, guys, if you enjoy Fortnite content, check out my second channel. I will leave a link down below in the description and in the comments. I'm starting up a Fortnite esports channel. It'll be very similar to this one. We'll cover all of the big tournaments, all of the teams, the players. We'll do lists, all the good stuff. But don't worry, guys. It won't affect my Overwatch League content at all. I'm still doing daily uploads. Even sometimes we'll be doing the double uploads. So don't you guys worry. But if you do enjoy Fortnite content, go check out my videos on that channel. The link will be down below. Drop a subscription. And if you just support me at all, go drop a like, go drop a sub on the channel. It helps me out and it will allow me to keep doing this stuff full time. And yeah, I'll see you guys tomorrow. 